Reading with your kids. Hey, 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 so great to see you. Come on in. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and grateful that you are part of our beautiful Reading With Your Kids family. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Amazon Music, Spotify, Ghana, Himalaya, Apple Podcasts, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is reading expert Dr. Katherine Garforth here to talk about dyslexia during Dyslexia Awareness Month. Dr. Catherine takes us on a real deep dive into the subject of dyslexia, especially helping us understand how we can best support our kids who are challenged with reading uh, by dyslexia and how we can help them succeed. I, I recently I need to give a shout out to the fourth graders down at the Amanda Stout School in Reading, Pennsylvania. I just performed my educational magic show for them through the magic of technology. I had a blast. We had hundreds of kids watching the show and participating. I'm amazed. I'm really amazed at, at how much fun I'm having. I'm amazed at how interactive a virtual show can be. Here we are. I'm in Boston. The kids are, are spread out across the city of Reading, Pennsylvania, each in their own homes. But they're all able to, to really love the magic, the expressions, to see a, a, a hundred and a hundred or more faces just light up with their eyes light up and their smiles light up when they see magic. And, and, and to be able to talk to them and have them participate and make the magic happen. I just love it. And I would love to bring this magic to your community. I know that you're probably not the principal of your kid's school, but you know the principal. You know your kid's teacher. I am offering a limited number of schools and classrooms an opportunity to book a free performance, a free virtual performance of my show. All you need to do is go to our website, wewillroar.com. Joining us on the line right now from Vancouver in British Columbia in Canada. She's a reading expert, and I'm really excited to have her here today so we can talk about how we can support our kids' reading development. Please welcome to the show Dr. Catherine Garforth. Dr. Catherine, how are you? I'm well, thank you. And yourself? Really well. It's a little cold here in Boston, I have to say. I wasn't quite ready for that. We were swimming in the pool last week, and now we're freezing. So Dr. Catherine is dealing with something that a lot of us are dealing with here in uh, the States, remote learning. And uh, yeah. she was saying, you know, her kids were just logging in. My wife has been teaching upstairs. I can hear her right up o over the studio. That must present uh, a whole lot of challenges for families. Yes, it does, especially because parents don't necessarily have that educational background as teachers and knowing how to support their children. And reading research has come a huge way in the past 30 to 40 years. So many of the ways that the parents were taught to reading are known not to be best practice anymore. And, you know, parents don't necessarily have the background in knowing how to support their child's reading development. If we look at what the research says, reading can basically be boiled down into two key components. And this is called the simple view of reading. And that means that children need to be able to decode words and they need to understand the language. Now, they can't just be good at one of these skills. They have to be good at both for them to be able to read um, words, uh, read a book, and understand what it means. And looking at the weakness process, the profile, or the strength and weakness profile, you can learn about a lot about where your child needs support. So if your child's struggling to read the words, it doesn't matter how good their language comprehension is, how good they're able to understand what's being spoken to them, because if they can't understand, or if they can't identify what the words are on the page, they're not going to be able to understand the language. If they can read the words, but they don't know the words and they don't know how to understand the language, they're not going to be able to understand what they're reading. And then there are combinations of this presentation where they're poor at reading 
uh, the words and they have a hard time understanding it. And the big problem that comes is similar to the Matthew effect where we have the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. So one of the best ways to help reading once children know how to read is by reading because then you get this huge exposure to more words, right? And if your child's a reluctant reader and not having that same exposure, they're not getting the practice reading the words. They're not getting the exposure to the new vocabulary and the experience of the written word. When we read written language, it's so much rich, richer than spoken text, right? So in an everyday conversation, you're not talking about the wall color or the feeling of the room or how something is being said. You're just observing that. So when we're reading to our children, it's amazing because they're getting this richer language experience and a uh, larger vocabulary exposure. Yeah, one of the things that we've um, uh, reported on here <laughs> is the studies that say that kids who are read to will hear uh, a million more words than their peers that aren't read to. Exactly. So it's, and that's because the written language is so much richer and more structured than spoken language. And you don't have the dialect and you need to have more explanation about what's going on to set the mood. And I guess one issue when we come across struggling readers is there is a genetic component to uh, learning disabilities like dyslexia. Mm -hmm. So if a child has dyslexia, it's highly likely that their one of their parents has struggled with reading in the past. So the parent may not be able to give them that same rich language experience by reading them to the text. But there were ways that we can supplement this, like letting them listen to audiobooks or nonfiction radio shows, podcasts, even things like Wild Kratts is better than watching um, something like Peppa Pig because just the language that they're going into and it's more of that nonfiction exposure that you're giving the children and giving them these words. And, you know, maybe if you as a parent aren't comfortable at reading these things, get an audiobook, listen along. A lot of libraries have these available. Point along to the words as they read and so that the children see the association between the, the spoken word and the written word, mm -hmm. and then you'll have this rich language experience. One example that I like to use is a, another way that parents can help their child expand their vocabulary is being very conscious about the vocabulary that they're using when they're speaking to their child. As a parent, I know how easy it is to fall into the baby talk and talking about boo-boos or flowers or pretty or nice. But it's better to, oh, I see you have a bruise, or that's a scrape, it's a cut, or was that a gash, and describe it to them. You, you mentioned <laughs> dyslexia, and this is Dyslexia Awareness Month. What is, are you able to describe exactly what dyslexia is? Well, so there's a couple ways to approach that. There is what the public views as dyslexia, and that typically has to do with a reading disability. Now, professionally speaking, when you're talking about a disability in reading, that's a specific disability or a specific learning disorder in reading, right? And so if your child has a problem with reading and they get a psychoeducational assessment, they're going to have the diagnosis of a specific learning disorder in reading because that's the current term used diagnostically. Dyslexia refers to a specific type of problem with reading, and that's decoding of the words. So if you remember earlier, I was talking about how reading can be boiled down into two main um, skills, the word identification and the language comprehension. Someone with dyslexia struggles with the word identification and not necessarily the language comprehension. So where they are struggling is trying to figure out what those letters on the page say and how to put those together. A large weakness that dyslexics 
most commonly have is something uh, called a weakness in phonological awareness, specifically phonemic awareness. Now, phonological awareness is the awareness of sounds within our spoken language. And each language has a different set of phonemes. The English language, depending on where you live, has anywhere from 40 to 44. And that depends on dialect and accent. These phonemes are something that we need to increase the sensitivity in students with dyslexia so that they can um, notice the subtle differences between the sounds. And that's an area that they can struggle with. And then also being able to pull those sounds apart. So if I were to say cat in its individual phonemes, it would be at, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what we're getting kids to do when they're sounding out words. We're asking them to say the sound that each letter makes. So when they see the word cat, they're going to say C. Okay, well, C makes the sound K, K, A. A makes the sound A, A, T. T makes the sound T. So now they have K, A, T. But then they need to learn how to blend those sounds together into that word so they can recognize the word, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a skill that we can work on. And these are things that we can do in a very fun, play-based manner with our children. This is a skill that be phonological awareness begins developing in the preschool years. And the best ways that parents can help their children develop these skills is by doing a lot of rhyming and games and reading books full of alliteration. The English language and how we write our English language system, we use a um, phoneme and an alphabetic approach. So our language is based on having letters represent sounds or graphemes representing phonemes. As I said, the English language has between 40 to 44 phonemes. But as most of you should know, there are 26 letters in the English alphabet. But our problem is there are more sounds in the English language than there are letters mm -hmm. in our alphabet. Now, to make things even more complicated, there's more than 200 different ways that we represent those sounds by letter and letter combinations. So this is why the English language is so complex to teach, because to become a fluent reader, you need to have an awareness of these sounds. And if you learn the logic behind them, you can actually understand a lot more about why English words are spelt the way that they're spelt. Um, um, th this is really fascinating, and it reminds me of an interview we just had with um, uh, a, a, a reading tutor from Malaysia. Um, one of his, his beliefs is that one reason kids shut down early is that they encounter this, what, what you're just speaking about. We have 26 letters, and each is supposed to represent a sound, but we actually use 40 different sounds. And, you know, so it's, we don't, you know, we're, we're teaching them C is for cat, A is for apple, but we're not letting them know early enough that a is for apple most of the time, but there's these other times when A makes a different sound. And when should we teach and start introducing that idea to kids instead of, you know, them going up and, and, and oh, my mom taught me that, that this letter makes this sound, but, wow, it's making a different. I must be a dummy. I can't get this. Well, so I advocate for using a systematic, synthetic approach to a teaching phonics. So phonics is the instruction between the letters and the sounds that they represent. Now, there are a few letters in our alphabet that have a one-to-one -one correspondence. And what I mean by that is that that one letter just represents the one sound in our language. Um, but a lot of people innocently think that, you know, when you're teaching kids the relationship between letters and sound, you start at A and you end at Z, and then once you've done those, you're done. But that isn't, there is more than those letters or, and one sound relationships. 
So you want to teach it in a logical manner that's going to give kids access to the most enough number of words that they can read uh, that are meaningful to them from the start. So if you were to teach the first six letters of the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, and F, there are only a handful of meaningful words that have a simple enough structure that kids are going to be able to sound them out from the beginning and that they're going to be meaningful for them. Also, in those six letters, you are teaching B and D, which are two letters that are commonly confused. Mm -hmm. And you see the switching and the reversal problems in very close proximity to each other. I feel that it's better to teach students and children the letters in an order that's going to give them exposure to the most amount of words with teaching the least amount of letters. And these are going to be words that are meaningful and that they're familiar with and they can sound out. The letters that I suggest teaching first are S-A-T-P-I-N. I use these letters because there are a huge number of words that kids are going to be able to read right off the bat from using just these six letters and sounding them out with that first sound that we're going to be able to teach them with their relationship. Now, this means that they can then move on to decodable texts. Decodable texts are texts where 90 to 95% of the words within the text are going to be based on the sound and symbols that they know already. There are going to be a few words that you're going to want to pre-teach, and those are the articles like and, is, the, that they're not necessarily good, or they won't know basing on sounding them out, but they're high-frequency words that children need to learn. And through the exposure, they're going to learn these words fairly quickly. So when they're reading the decodable text, they're going to be able to sound these words out successfully and get meaning from the text fairly quickly. And then you start adding in more letters. Whereas with the uh, predictable text that we often see sent home with home reading, the kids will be given a pattern. Like the cat is sleeping, the cat is happy, whatever. And the words are using a number of different spelling patterns using a whole bunch of different letter sounds, and it's not teaching the child the skills to sound out and to code the word. And when you're reading books that have pictures, you can kind of get the predictable nature of the book and take a fairly good guess about what the word is saying. But as kids get older and start entering those intermediate grades, middle school grades, when they are reading to learn, their books are not going to have the same amount of pictures. The predictability isn't there. And when they're reading and throughout that time, they're going to be exposed to at least 4,000 new vocabulary words. So there are going to be words that your child isn't familiar with that they're not necessarily going to be able to guess mm -hmm. without having the skills to sound out that word and have the word attack to figure out what it is. This is this is really fascinating. It's uh, you know I'm I'm happy that you're on here because you know we talk about reading with your kids and reading with your kids has all these benefits and and, and it does, but reading is uh, a much more complex skill and um, and and I, I think it's important for parents and for kids uh, or for parents to help their kids not get frustrated to. Let them know that, that, hey, this is an easy kid, you know. Uh, this is rocket science in a lot of ways. Yes. Yeah, and there are articles talking about how reading is rocket science. And I guess the huge thing that parents are often not told about is that reading is not a natural process. The vast majority of children are not going to automatically learn how to read by just having you read to them and you pointing out what letters and sounds like. There's a structure to our language. And if we look at the brain evolutionarily speaking, reading does not occur in one area, right? 
the written word has only been around for a couple thousand years and it hasn't been widespread and different languages take different approaches to reading. So there hasn't been this one centralized area dedicated just to reading. So as children learn how to read, they need to learn how to connect three different areas of their brain to become a fluent, competent reader. First, they need to make the connection between the letters and the sounds and be able to sound out the words. And as they get better, that repeated exposure to the same word is going to imprint it into their orthographic memory. And that's going to be a big word. Um, but basically, it means through a lot of exposure, they're going to develop it into their sight vocabulary or words that they can recognize automatically within a fraction of a sentence or of a second. Mm -hmm. And this is what your goal is to develop that sight vocabulary and have it so that when they look at the word, they're not sounding out. They know it just because they recognize it and they have read it so many times. Uh, and that's when you start becoming that fluent, skilled reader, where you have that automaticity of seeing the words, knowing what they are, and then you can focus on understanding the text of what you are reading. I think this understanding is important for parents, and I think it's also important for kids to understand. I, I think kids are able to accept the fact that we have different gifts, and, and kids see that there are some kids who can shoot a basketball and it's natural to them and it's not natural for other kids and, and some kids can can dance and pirouette whereas other kids struggle with it. And and they're able to accept that and it's you know, they might want to be that great basketball player, but they'll be able to live if 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 they're not, or they'll be able to work hard on it. I think with when it comes to reading, I think when when kids find it difficult they they just start to think of themselves as losers. And and being able to read is so much more important than doing a pirouette or shooting a basketball. So how can we support our kids and help them know that uh, you're struggling, you're going to be able to get this, don't worry, we're going to support you? Well, you need to remind them that it's not a natural process. Mm -hmm. And that while it's easy for some, it's not for others. And that with the right support, you can succeed. I myself am dyslexic and didn't learn how to read until I was in grade five. Uh, and that's because they, I was able to get that systematic instruction mm -hmm. and have the private tutoring that I needed to learn how to read. Now, it's something that you need to understand where your child is struggling, right? So you need to make sure that your child has the foundational skills that they need for reading because if you're working on a higher level skill, they're not going to achieve that success, right? So if you're teaching them the letter sound relationships of phonics, but they are struggling with phonological awareness and really being able to break that word up into its sounds, the phonics instruction will be helpful, but it's not going to see that big growth and success because they're not ready for that skill, right? When we bring our babies home from the hospital, we don't immediately stand them up and expect them to walk, mm -hmm. right? You realize that there's a developmental trajectory, and we just need to become more conscious of that trajectory and realize that there is five essential components to be a, a competent reader. They are phonological awareness, which is the awareness of the speech sounds within a language. They are phonics, which is the relationship between the letters and those speech sounds. There is vocabulary. There is reading fluency and reading comprehension. Now, when you're being asked to work on reading fluency, you want to make sure that it's at the independent level of your child. So that means if your child's struggling to sound out words in something that you're reading with them, that's not a piece to work on fluency. Because in order to be a fluent reader, you have to have that sight vocabulary or that automatic recognition of the words that I was speaking about earlier. Right? Mm -hmm. And... For reading comprehension, you need to have fluent reading. 
So if your child isn't able to fluently read the passage, they're not going to have the energy or the ability to focus on the text to understand what it means because their current uh, energy is being spent trying to figure out what it's saying. They don't have the ability to remember what they read before. So if they're trying to sound out a word, they're not going to remember how it relates to the words they read before. Doctor, I understand that uh, you have, um, uh, you, you provide educational support to families throughout uh, the Vancouver area. Can you uh, let us know about that and where folks can uh, find out more about that? Sure. I actually uh, do a lot of online work, so I am oh. working with families around the world. Um, I have a website, www.garforthseducation.com. Uh, I have a Facebook page called Garforth Education. In that page, I run, uh, every month I run a challenge for parents on how to support their child's reading development. So I teach you about different ways that you can support those five skills with your child. Uh, and I have two Facebook groups specifically for parents. Uh, one is the Garforth Education Parent Group, and this is a group where I'm just helping parents help their child succeed in education. I look at reading, math, looking at things called executive functioning, which is like the command center of our brain, mm -hmm. um, and helping develop areas like fine motor skills. And then I have Garforth Education's Exceptional Parent Group. And this is where I target parents with children who have exceptionalities or special needs. And I help them learn how to better advocate for their child uh, learning about individualized education plans and those interventions that their child is going to need to get the success they need in education. So much support that you're providing with parents. That's really wonderful. And you gave us a lot to think about today, and we really appreciate that. We've been speaking to Dr. Catherine Garforth. Dr. Catherine, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Leah Orleans. She is a circus performer extraordinaire, and she is one half of the amazing circus troupe Acrobatrix. She'll be here to tell us a little bit uh, uh, about circus life, about performing, and also about some great exercises that we can do with our kids to help them stay active. That's the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, I want to thank our guest, Dr. Catherine Garford. Be sure to check out her website. I also want to thank my incredible team, starting with my amazing daughter, Alejandra Doherty. I want to thank my producer, Fatima Khan. My awesome author, Ambassador Peggy Cotto. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. But most of all, I want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking this deep dive into dyslexia with us. And also, thank you so much for listening. But most of all, thank you so much for taking the time to make the world a better place. And you do that every time you read with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. <laughs>